Welcome to you today. I'm Paul Pepys, director of the Oregon Humanities Center. My guests today are Annette Gordon-Reed and Peter Onoff. Annette Gordon-Reed is the Charles Warren Professor of American Legal History at Harvard Law School and Professor of History in the Faculty of Arts and Sciences at Harvard University. Gordon-Reed won the 2009 Pulitzer Prize in History for the Hemingses of Monticello, an American family. Other honors include Guggenheim and MacArthur Fellowships, the National Humanities Medal, and the National Book Award. Peter Onoff is the Thomas Jefferson Memorial Foundation Professor Emeritus of History at the University of Virginia. He is a senior fellow at Monticello's Robert H. Smith International Center for Jefferson Studies. He is the author, co-author, and editor of numerous books on the third president, including Jefferson's Empire, The Language of American Nationhood, The Mind of Thomas Jefferson, and Jeffersonian Legacies. Gordon Reed and Onoff recently co-authored the book Most Blessed of the Patriarchs, Thomas Jefferson and the Empire of the Imagination. They presented a lecture conversation based on the book on April 21st, 2017, as the Oregon Humanities Center's Colin Rowe Thomas O'Fallon Memorial Lecturers in Law and American Culture. Their conversation was part of the 2016-17 Humanities series. Thank you both for coming on the show. Glad to be, to be here. So my first question is, what led to your respective fascinations with Thomas Jefferson? And I imagine that you were led there from different directions. Oh, she's got a good story. Mine's very simple. It's just serendipity. Serendipity. <laughs> serendipity. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I ended up in Charlottesville, and they expected me to do something about Jefferson. I'm from New England. I have inherited cultural suspicions <laughs> about, <laughs> about uh, this rabid Jacobin uh, Thomas Jefferson. I'm exaggerating this, but uh, uh, and that story is really fascinating, and you're about to hear it. No, I became interested in Jefferson when I was a kid, uh, reading a child's biography of Jefferson, uh, a ser uh, one of a series of biographies of famous people, George mm -hmm. Washington Carver, all people like that. And um, he was the most interesting to me because he you know, presented sort of a strange mixture of a person who in the book emphasized that he was a declaration, wrote the Declaration of Independence and he was a slave owner. And I just thought it was an interesting character. And I kind of stuck with it. You kind of stuck I with it. I kind of stuck with it, yeah. yeah. Uh, just, just to be clear, I used to accuse Annette of liking Jefferson too much. <laughs> well, we switch pos you know, positions on that now. Yeah. Yeah, I would say so. You really? Do you think I like yeah, him? Yeah, I think, yeah, I think right. so. I think so. <laughs> Well, you you uh, you captured the you know the the question like the contradiction or the paradox mm -hmm. that a lot of people talk mm -hmm. about. On the one hand, here's this guy who is this great enlight enlightenment theorist of the rights of man and sure. independence, and on the other hand, he's a slave owner mm -hmm. who lives mm -hmm. on this plantation mm -hmm. with all these human beings that he owns. Mm -hmm. So, um, this is you know this contradiction. Everybody's been grappling with this contradiction. There's been times when the critical view has been he's a hero. More recently, it's been he's a devil. Um, so what what contribution to this book? I mean, how many books on Jefferson well, are there? Have you ever counted how many there are? No, was? I think there were, new, you know, this sands, is, like the is, sands Paul, of the world. This is the last one. The last this is the last one. This is the last book that will ever be written about Jefferson. Uh, well. So what is, it, um, what is it that you guys contribute to this argument, this discussion? Well, I'll, I'll start by okay, sure. you, uh, the title and uh, she thinks I'm going to say patriarch, and we'll get to that, but I'd say blessed as well. Uh, Jefferson was a great believer. He was a deist in the ordering of nature. He believed in progress. The subtitle, Empire of Imagination, mm -hmm. uh, suggests that. Uh, but the key term is patriarch because our goal in this book is to reconcile what is seen as a fundamental split between the private and the public Jefferson, the statesman whom we honor for his words as the author of the American Creed and the Declaration. And then we have the private life, which embarrasses us. Uh, but I think what we're trying to do is not only show that you can't extricate one from the other, but the private life deeply informs the public performance. And the key thing here is that that notion of paternal authority, patriarchal authority, that notion of household governance is absolutely central to his vision of republicanism. And we wanted to try to show what Jefferson thought he was doing in the world. One right. of the things we say is, you know, there have been so many books, all those, you know, as numberless as the grains of sand, you know, in, of, of Jefferson biographies <laughs> and writings. One less grain of sand. One less grain of sand. 
is you know, people are talking about what we think Jefferson ought to have been doing. Mm -hmm. And you can sort of go through the list of things that we think you should have done this, you should have done that. And we were trying to figure out what he thought he was doing in the world. Mm -hmm. To get back mm -hmm. to him to figure out what does this person who's you know, born in Virginia in a slave society who thinks of himself as this uh, part of the, uh, of the Enlightenment and, and greatly influenced by Enlightenment values that make him skeptical of organized religion, that make him anti-slavery, mm -hmm. that make him pro-science, uh, that makes him pro-progress. What did this guy think that he was trying to do in the world? Mm -hmm. And he, the fascinating thing, you asked me what fascinated me about him, was this person who decided to sort of make a place for himself in the world. He was going to be an actor in the world, and he actually managed to accomplish that to a degree that's pretty astonishing. If you think of the length of time that he was, mm -hmm. um, that he was uh, in public life uh, and the influences that he had, the political influence that he had from his presidency, from the 1790s, the formation of of parties, the beginning of a party, mm -hmm. his presidency, and then his acolytes after that. He goes into Jackson, and we've not replicated that kind of political influence from anybody ever since then. Mm -hmm. And we're suggesting that one of the reasons he has this influence is he sees himself as working with the flow of history. And enlightenment is a progressive condition, mm -hmm. and the more light that shed. If you believe things are getting better, then it's clear what your agenda is to contribute to that improvement. And our problem, it's not Jefferson's problem, is we don't believe that anymore, yeah. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So enlightenment, at least half of the academics we know think the enlightenment was a bad thing. Mm -hmm. I happen to be for it. You happen to be for it. Well, in this particular time, it's sort of an interesting thing to think about. <laughs> it is. I wanted to come back, but that's it, this, the progress. And so when he says slavery will be solved, that, that this will, will come to a solution about that and other things, People were saying, oh, you're just punting. You don't really mean it. You don't really want slavery yeah, to go yeah. away. Uh, he did want slavery to go away, and he wanted mm -hmm. black people to go away, too, mm -hmm. but uh, from the United States. But he thought that eventually people would figure out a way to rid themselves of this in much the same way people say today sometimes, well, one of these days we'll figure this stuff out. Mm -hmm. But we're not as certain about progress as he was because he'd seen things happen, you know, inoculation. Um, scientific discoveries, mechanical things. He, it was all, he was very much about new, about the new things, and that eventually, uh, you know, that this progress, this notion of this process mm -hmm. would go forward and things would get better and better. Mm -hmm. And as Peter said, we don't really, we're not so sure no, about that I now. think progress for us has been demystified. Uh, it's uh, associated with technology, mm -hmm. with things that we can have and use but we don't associate it with morality. Mm -hmm. That fundamental improvement that an enlightened thinker, particularly steeped in Scottish enlightenment philosophy, would be thinking about the human condition, mm -hmm. human flourishing, what can we become. For us, we separate. We're specialists. This is, of course, the critique of the modern university. We don't talk to each other because we have our silos. In fact, you could, that's a broad description of society at large. But if you think it's all connected in the way Jefferson did, and you see, you connect the discoveries in what we would call science or natural philosophy, they're connected with a, a better understanding of human nature. They're connected with what's called natural religion in this period. It's all one whole. That's the aspiration you can see manifest in Jefferson's library. Yeah, and he's at the beginning of something. He starts a country. Think of what it would be like to start from scratch and to have yeah, a place we're, where we're, most we're people. Yeah, we're eager to do that now. Can yeah. we do that? <laughs> <laughs> well, all right. No, leaving so that li leaving, that, leaving that stuff aside, but I mean, you know, he's. We don't have a public education system mm -hmm. that we have today. I mean, there's things to be done. There are many, many things to, to be done. Yeah. So this notion yeah. of improvement of people, it's clear. You know, you take a group of people who, you know, read, you know, fairly well or in, they can do figures or whatever, but what if you had a public <laughs> education system and you could put people in it and it would get better and better and better. So he has something to play with here, or, with or, a new or, country. Or take this very idea of the new country. You have people who are once subjects, mm -hmm. subjects of a monarchy who were not independent agents, uh, who didn't, who submitted or, or uh, to the authority of uh, a monarch. You see those subjects become citizens. Yeah. Have you seen progress? Yes, you've seen it. You've lived it. Uh -huh, absolutely, and we don't, we take it sort of uh, the notion of kings and, and monarchies, and that's sort of a oh, joke to us. You know, but for him, that's, it was a big deal to go from a king to a republic, mm -hmm. and that he was, 
you know, at the at the beginning of all of this and becomes the head of it. So that's so. Long story short, this is what the book is trying to capture: um, the thoughts and uh, the aspirations of this particular person who is flawed, as we all are, uh, but not so much on again what we think he ought to be doing, because you know you don't have to do any research to say, well, he should have done this, he mm -hmm. should have done that, or the other thing. So given your interest in his own self-understanding and everything you've just said about uh, his commitment to enlightenment values, so how does he uh, understand uh, his role at Monticello as the slave owner, and how does he reconcile or put together this notion of progress with mm -hmm. the slaves that he owns that he's I mean and, and I you know I obviously you're you you have both researched extensively about the Hemingses how does he make how does that how can he live that contradiction how can he reconcile that well he lives the contradiction in the way we all live contradictions in our lives he sees himself as that thing that we don't think exists a benevolent slave owner mm -hmm. he d does this by saying you know I am in this situation, we're part of this institution, I am the master of Monticello, and I'm going to be the best master that I can be. And of course, the problem with that is once you start to see yourself as making slavery better, it makes, you, makes it easier for you to live in it. Mm -hmm. You don't, you, right. you see yourself as a good person, as we, we tend to do, and even people who are manifestly not that, uh, try to construct a world in which they see themselves as good, and that's what he does. He, uh, all of his acts of benevolence towards individual enslaved mm -hmm. people, particularly the Hemings is, you could sort of, you know, he gives himself a little check, mm -hmm. uh, saying, I'm not like other people. I am trying to, uh, as one of Peter's students um, said, talking about amelioration, ameliorating uh, right, right, the yeah, institution. That's, that's two ways. Right? Of, of, uh, of, of the institution, and that's, that's sort of, the death of the kind of young man who sees himself as anti-slavery or sees s slaves, enslaved people and masters or people, enslavers if you want to call them, in a state of war. But then he thinks they're not at war at Monticello because mm -hmm. he's, not, he's, he's not an evil person. He's a person who's trying to make the system better, which of course, as we said, makes it easier for him to live in it. Mm -hmm. We see the contradiction, you use that word, and we jump to the conclusion he's got to be a hypocrite. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Practice and profession, they just don't mesh in any way. I think the key thing is try to think in his time, and the past is a foreign country, as we've heard, that's a cliche. Uh, we don't know the language, we have to learn it. We have to, uh, uh, we, we have to be translators of that world to this world. And I think a key word for Jefferson, which is very jarring for us, is nature mm -hmm. and all its uh, permutations. For somebody in Jefferson's time, it's not a far stretch to say that the authority of the father in household governance uh, is natural. Mm -hmm. uh, that is, uh, he, that's not to say that a republic can't be created out of equal citizen patriarchs, mm -hmm. but patriarchy is a given. Think of property law mm -hmm. in the uh, late 18th century. 99% of property is uh, in the hands of men, and what isn't is for special reasons under equity or right. other circumstances that women have control over property. They have claims on property, uh, of course, but that idea that property naturally is held by men, that fathers, uh, have that authority, and most importantly, then in a largely agricultural economy, the unit of production is the household. Mm -hmm. And so if you imagine now, well, we have to have overpaid C CEOs at every American company, they have to make 1,000 times the workers on the floor if there are any workers on the floor. Uh, now, I'm Jefferson now, I'm saying that's unnatural, mm -hmm. that kind of inequality, because nature ordains the family unit. Mm -hmm. Now that's what's seeming strange to us now because where are they? They've disappeared. We have other ways of organize, uh, organizing ourselves in society and in the economy. And he sees himself as the slave owner, a patriarch. He's yeah. not just the patriarch of, of, of you know, Martha and Mariah, uh, his daughters with his wife. He's a patriarch of the people on his plantation. And that's the thing that's jarring to us because yeah, yeah. he, this sort of imposed family notion. Now, of course, he actually has a real biological family mm -hmm. with people, but for the larger sense of enslaved people at Monticello, that kind of paternalism 
uh, is something that we recoil at. But that's, again, thinking about him, that's, that's what he thinks he's doing. And he's, not, he's being responsible in the way he is handling himself with women, with mm -hmm. wives, mm -hmm. uh, with enslaved people, with children, the people over whom he has charge. And this is a kind of, the patriarchy is a system that we're you know, in the process of trying to dismantle. Uh, or some of us are. Well, we've, uh, we've done it effectively in this particular unit. Yeah, well, so. well <laughs> you say, mm -hmm. um, you say, but it, he, for him, this was a natural thing, and that's how it fits to him in ways that could never, we could never really accept. And something also is natural is the uh, expression of affectionate feelings. We predicate that on equality. Mm -hmm. That's what's normal for us, because how can you have genuine affection for somebody you own, control, have a th power over. But Jefferson would turn it around on you and say, I'm in the position where I have to exercise authority mm -hmm. over the people in my household, mm -hmm. but I care about them as human beings mm -hmm. and they love me too. Mm -hmm. say, oh yeah, give me a break. Do they really love you? And there's a whole literature on the history of slavery that suggests there's a lot of duplicity in those mm -hmm. asymmetrical relationships. But what we ask you to do is to put yourself in Jefferson's time. Mm -hmm. And we see this all as cheap and easy rationalization. But for him, I think it's a logical application of his, he's a very sentimental guy. I mean, feelings are important. Uh, yeah, and, and you don't him. have to accept. I mean, the idea is we don't have to accept what he's doing. I think maybe what happened in the past is people are looking for a Jefferson that they can love. Mm -hmm or Jefferson, even sometimes that they can hate. Mm -hmm. But we really want to have a Jefferson that we're trying to have, a Jefferson that you can at least understand. Uh, it's not about, history's not about the people who you know you love and want to have a beer it's with It's not about you. And it, yeah, and yeah, and it's not about us, because it could be about us, as I said, if you just wanted to talk about the things he should have done, we could just sort of sit down and do that <laughs> as an essay. But to actually go through and see the actions that he takes, the things that he writes, and try to interpret them, it's really about trying to get into his head for a time and um, you know see, see what's there. Don't have to accept it, but I think it's better than just a sort of ritual condemnation or ritual love. One of the things I found fascinating, a, a, a chunk of the book is about the uh, time that he lived in France. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he brings a couple of slaves there with him. Mm -hmm. And the way that the laws work there, they could have right. remained mm -hmm. and become free. Mm -hmm. And they chose not to. Yeah. Yeah. How do we make sense of that? Well, I mean, it's, I think it's no different from the situation of enslaved people, or little different than the situation of enslaved people in the United States, mm -hmm. um, who you have to decide whether you want to run away. Do you want to leave your family? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or, and, and you can be a free person, but you're free by yourself. Uh, and family meant a great deal yeah. to the Hemingses. Yeah. You, we don't have um, their words about their family until we get to later generations, but you can tell in the way they name each other. Mm -hmm. they, they name all of their children after one another, except yeah. Sally Hemings has to name her children after <laughs> Jefferson's people, but right. uh, the rest of them do. So if you think of two people who um, would be in a, in a foreign country, they might have a shot at something there. Uh, they, I you know, think they could have stayed perhaps with William Short, Jefferson's secretary who remained in Europe or something. Mm -hmm. But family is a big pull mm -hmm. for people to come back. And mm -hmm. most, many people decided to sort of face whatever life brought them uh, together with their family rather than being by mm -hmm. themselves. And another way to think about it is to question the absolute binary in theory between slavery and freedom, mm -hmm. which is so obvious to us because if that's the way we want to understand the American Civil War. Mm -hmm. That is, it's an absolute non-negotiable value. But how was freedom lived? I'm thinking of Chris Christopherson saying that freedom is just another word for nothing, nothing left, left to lose. lose. To be totally stripped of other attachments, to be at alone in the world, and this I think where family mm -hmm. comes in. Mm -hmm. uh, and in fact, anybody who studies the old regime or the America that emerges from the old regime would be impressed at the degrees of freedom and unfreedom. It's a spectrum. Uh, and to deny the agency of people who might choose to remain nominally or under the absolute authority under the law to a master because they're making a calculation in the context of negotiation about what means most to them. 
And that's and, and presumably family and those kinds mm -hmm. of family mm -hmm. connections. I mean, James Hemings, when he comes back uh, to the United States after time, Jefferson does free him and he travels about. Um, and there's some reason to think he goes back to Europe and he is sort of rootless in the world. And he, you know, it's a di very difficult thing for him. And so sitting from our perspective, you can say, you know, freedom would be the most important thing in the world, but you also think about family. That's mm -hmm. the cruelty. Mm -hmm. That's part of the cruelty of slavery, because even if a person is emancipated, the rest of the people whom they love are still in bondage. Mm -hmm. Your, the treatment of the time in, is in France is very interesting. It also impacts Jefferson. It makes him mm -hmm. look on the United mm -hmm. States in a different way. What mm -hmm. does he learn when he's there about the U.S.? It could be a lot worse. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we could have families like they, they have in France. Oh, you can yeah. have French women uh, running around in the streets it's and talking scary, politics. Scary, it's yeah. scary to him. He loves some things about it, uh -huh. but other things just really, really frighten him. And it's the family we talk. You know, we talk about this. The family form, a place where women mm -hmm. are not. Um, he was probably he probably thinks that they were much more free than they actually were, mm -hmm. but superficially, yeah, yeah. Um, these women had uh, interests. They had freedoms that American women did not. And he compares them. He says he says the French women are like Amazons to American angels, yeah. and angels are <laughs> people who look after their husbands and don't you know get out into politics That's and do happiness, various things. Okay. That's happiness, okay? That's happiness, okay. Yeah, patriarchy is right here. Um, Gotta say. Well, you know, I understand, but <laughs> so he it scares him. He thinks mm -hmm. that this is this is the worst that there could be, and so he looks back to the United States. He also is looks at the state of the French peasantry. Mm -hmm. uh, the mm -hmm. 1780s were a bad time in France. It led to something you may have heard about in the French Revolution, mm -hmm. uh, where people are starving in the streets, the beggars. And he says, you don't see things like this in America. They're poor people, but you don't have, you know, children who are abandoned and on the streets begging and so forth. And so he sees a, a society that is alien, a mm -hmm, society mm -hmm. that's frightening, and he says, well, you know, you know, he goes there thinking in, this, in many ways that people who have sort of Europe envy, um, but he goes there and says, hey, wait a minute. He Whoa. gets in this and says, I don't know, maybe we have some good things here yeah. too. Mm -hmm. Another thing that comes into view with a little help from Freud looking back, uh, again, Jefferson would uh, give us another binary opposition, loving, affectionate ties, uh, and then the enmity of those who, uh, who, who want to destroy those ties, who, who don't respect them. Mm -hmm. So love and its opposite, whatever that is, that's pretty clear to him. Whereas uh, uh, post Freudians would say, well, love and hate. Uh, let's talk about love as, uh, as attraction that you don't fully rationally understand or can control. The heart maybe is gonna lead you in a, a variety of perverse directions. He's aware of this uh, and this is why he's uh, deeply afraid of what would happen to young men, young American men who would learn to speak mm -hmm. in the wrong way, would uh, be seduced by women, and they could never go back mm -hmm. to America. And that, that, th this is very revealing about him mm -hmm. uh, of, of he, can, he can handle it because mm -hmm. he's mature, he's grown up, but his concern with character formation and anxiety about it uh, reflects uh, the uncertainties, the irrationalities, the impulses that are sometimes beyond our control. Mm -hmm. so, so this point about character formation, I, I assume this plays a role in the founding of the University of Virginia. What's, what's his view about that? Why, does that? why has that become something that he thinks has to happen, that he needs to do? <laughs> well, he couldn't get his public education system going, so the university is his baby, the thing that he's going to do. He's concerned that young men of Virginia uh, mm -hmm. who are talented will have to go up to Harvard and <laughs> Princeton and Whoa. Yale and those you know places up there. You know what happens to Southerners who go Southerners who go north uh, <laughs> and that they would be ruined by the, you know, the, mm -hmm. the, the uh, ideas of, of the Federalists and the people who are you know, against all the things that he thinks are worthwhile. Mm -hmm. So he wants a university so he could train uh, young, the young men of Virginia in the way that trained them up in the way that they should go uh, and with his enlightenment values and he has mm -hmm. when you think about it it's such a crazy idea of having a university in the middle of nowhere and all of these people from Oxford and they're gonna come from Europe and 
to the middle of, you know, Virginia. Well, the, the restaurants are good now. Yeah, well, no, good for now. It took a while. It took a while. But back then, you know, that this is, this is his vision, that he's going to shape young men, shape their characters, mm -hmm. have a secular university. Uh, no, a chapel will not be the center of it. All of his enlightenment values are in this place. Mm -hmm. So it's about character formation of young men to make them good Virginians and good Republicans. One of the things that he convinced himself about when he was in France and looking back at the American Revolution is that the people basically got it right. That is the mass of the people. They made the turn in 1776. The spirit of 1776 lives on in them. The people Jefferson doesn't trust are people of his own class. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so in a way, a finishing school mm -hmm. for the elite that might refine them, to use a favorite enlightenment term, mm -hmm. uh, that is where they could maybe unlearn or learn to mitigate the, the raucous behavior and riotous uh, impulses of plantation life. Mm -hmm. He knows all about that. He writes about it in the notes in the state of Virginia. So uh, the great and interesting, ironic, even tragic story is Jefferson lived long enough to see the kind of boys who would come to the University of Virginia and we like to tell the story of how Professor John Davis, the mathematician in 1841, was shot dead on the, on the grounds of the <laughs> university. What, took, what it took to make UVA a decent place to learn was a religious revival. Hmm. And it's the great hmm. irony of it. Of course, when, even before the guy gets shot, he's long dead, Jefferson's long dead, he's there long enough to see them rowdy you know, and that out of control with the tears going and he's down crying head. he's actually they bring him to tears uh, watching because he had such hopes for them thinking yeah. that they were all like the him and he, when he would be <laughs> he would be going to uh, you know he was the hard student that he was he expected everybody else to be as well that was his sort of idealized vision of it didn't turn out that way it took a while it took a uh, while uh, this may be a dimension of what we're hinting at is the pathos of the ambitions the mm -hmm. the anxiety that they will not be fulfilled. His misgivings about himself, his misgivings about his class, his misgivings about America. Mm -hmm. My last question, we've got less than a minute left. Mm -hmm. um, you guys are fascinating to talk to, it's just r rocketed by. Are you collaborating again on any other projects? Is that, do you see that in the <laughs> well, future? He says this is his last book. I'll believe right. that when I see it. <laughs> no, <laughs> well, if you know. don't see it, you'll believe it. <laughs> <laughs> you'll believe it till now. <laughs> Okay, well, we'll just wait and see what happens. Well, little, little projects. Little projects. Yeah, we like to do things together. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to teach a course next summer oh. together. Mm -hmm. We come up with excuses. So maybe in desperation, I'll agree to collaborate on something else. Well, maybe, maybe we could produce a movie. What do you think? Yeah, maybe we could do that. Oh, okay. <laughs> Most blessed of the patriarchs. Uh, yes, indeed. Well, I want to thank you both for taking the time to speak with us today. It's been really enjoyable. Thank you, thank you for having you us. I've been speaking with Jefferson scholars Annette Gordon-Reed and Peter Onoff. They gave a lecture a conversation, Most Blessed of the Patriarchs, Thomas Jefferson and the Empire of the Imagination, on April 21st, 2017, as the Oregon Humanities Center's O'Fallon Memorial Lecturers in Law and American Culture. Their talk was part of the 2016-2017 Humanities Series. Thanks so much for watching. Thank you.